Today we've got a great revenge story against the neighborhood tattletale. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, I gave my bully teacher what he deserved. I never liked Mr. Smith. It wasn't the typical student-teacher ruckus over some undone assignment or lack of initiative. Mr. Smith was a bully. He was the one paid to checkmate and punish the bullies in the classroom. But he was equally a bully, and I made sure he got what was coming to him right in the face. The first time he walked into the classroom, we knew he was going to be trouble. Good day, young boys and girls, he said without a trace of a smile on his face. I'm Mr. Jake Smith, and I will be your substitute math teacher and class teacher. While I'm here, you are to follow every one of my rules. None of you is excluded. Defaulting of any sort will result in punishment. I expect discipline at all times and with all of your endeavors. Mind you, you are not permitted to call me Mr. Jake. You will address me as Mr. Smith. And with that, he began to write on the board. He didn't bother to ask our names or get acquainted with us. He went straight to the business and started to teach. We later realized why he didn't need our names. Fatty, he called, gesturing to Alicia. Come forward and help the class with equation four. The class went silent. Everyone turned to look at Alicia, who didn't move a muscle and just stared back at him in shock. Fatty, he said again. Is there that much fat in your body that it also slows your brain down? She wasn't even that fat. We were newly turned teenagers, for Christ's sake. She probably just hadn't lost her baby fat. Alicia turned bright red and somehow stumbled to the front of the classroom. She took the marker in her shaky hands and gaped at the board. You know what you remind me of looking so big and red and stupid? A tomato. Sorry, a fat tomato. The shock that had first enveloped the class wore off, and all the nasty boys and girls burst into laughter. Tears streamed down Alicia's face as her embarrassment grew. Obviously, she couldn't pay enough attention to the math question before her and made some calculation errors, which resulted in more hurtful jokes from Mr. Smith and triggered more laughter from the class. I didn't laugh. Nothing about it was funny. He'd hurt an innocent child and maybe I was just a lot more mature than the rest of my classmates because I was the youngest child out of five children or something, but I immediately realized something that the rest of the class didn't. If he was treating Alicia that way on his first day here then we'd be in a lot of trouble till Miss Felicia, our actual teacher, returned. During recess that day, I looked for Alicia all over the school, but I couldn't find her. I'd given up on the idea of finding her and wandered to the bathroom to fix my rat's nest of hair when I heard sniffles in the stall beside me. I looked down and noticed bright blue sneakers, the type Alicia wore, and I knew she'd have to be in there. I called out to her, but she didn't want to let me in or come out of the bathroom stall herself. She said she wanted to be alone, but it seemed like she needed some support. So I crawled underneath the door and into the stall she was in. It was gross, but I was way too worried about her to just leave that way. Also, the floor was thankfully clean and dry. Her eyes were blood red like she'd been crying for a long time, and her heaving sobs turned into loud wailing as I put my arms around her. I was scared she'd attract some unwanted attention with all of the noise. Finally, the intensity of her cries reduced, and she choked out a string of sentences that made my heart go out to her to this day. It's not my fault, you know. Ma says fat has been in our family for ages. I try to beat it, though. I don't eat at supper time even when it's my favorite. She paused to blow her nose on the tissue I just handed her. Pa said it won't help and I'm just wasting my time because I'm destined to be a fatty. I linked my hand through hers and walked her back to class that day fending off the childish boys who repeated the cruel jokes that Mr. Smith had said. Soon, though, his jokes weren't funny to anyone. Everyone now had a private beef to hold against him. Chris didn't find it hilarious that Mr. Smith thought his hair made him look like a porcupine. Anne wasn't amused when he repeatedly insisted that she must have turtle genes in her body for taking her time doing things. And Jacob certainly didn't giggle when Mr. Smith drew attention to the fact that his family didn't have much. They all realized how painful his words were when it was directed at them, and we fervently prayed for dear Miss Felicia to return to the class. Sadly, she never did. She'd had cancer of the larynx, which was a very weird part of the body to get cancer if you ask me, and she may never be able to use her voice normally again. To our utmost horror, Mr. Smith turned from our substitute teacher to our permanent teacher. No one liked the idea of being stuck with him permanently, but we couldn't possibly complain or report him to anyone because we were so scared to death by him. We feared that he would keep his promise and finally have an excuse to rip our brains out of our heads. So we suffered in silence. 
Mr. Smith stuffed us with a lot of schoolwork. Math homework, math morning drills, three pop quizzes a week, geography research assignments, poem presentations, and that's just a list of few. He only taught math, yet he found a way to choke us with assignments on other subjects. I was popularly a good student, and I didn't quite find school much a lot of bother, but I could never fully concentrate in his classes. I'd be minding my business, paying attention while he teaches, and boom, he'd make one nasty comment about someone, and I'd not be able to stop myself from imagining painful and terrifying things happening to him. I was only a child. There wasn't much else I could do, but wish to see him in the kind of tears, he'd made my classmates like Alicia suffer. Funny enough, he hadn't personally attacked me at that time. I was experiencing what I'd like to call aggression by mutual induction. I could feel how he'd upset all of my friends and classmates around me, and I wasn't happy about it. But I hadn't gone crazy yet. He'd had no reason to mock me so far. I was a good student. I was quite active. I wasn't fat or too skinny. My parents had enough. I was a go-getter and so on. But one day, I missed a question on a test that he'd considered to be easy. He looked me dead in the eyes and said, Your family does seem to have a history of disappointment, doesn't it? First your brother Gerald and now you? I gasped in shock. How dare he? That was a touchy subject. I loved Gerald with all of my heart, but he'd gotten in with the wrong friend. He'd got addicted to some drugs and had been sent to rehab a few months before then. It was callous of Mr. Smith to mention it so casually. How in heavens did he know about that? He'd never taught him or knew him. I stared at him coldly, all the inherent anger in my body rising into my bloodstream. Of course, you'd know what it means to be a disappointment, I spat, not listening to all the alarms going off in my body that I was about to get myself killed. Your parents must be so proud having a son who teaches high school and wears the same pair of pants that reek of failure every other day. He must have never imagined being disrespected like that by any of his students, or particularly by me, because he seemed unable to form words for like 20 seconds. And then he pulled me by my ear and dragged me to the principal's office. Our principal was like the average principal in any other school. Stern always jumping to conclusions, and believing the teachers over any student. You, she'd said after listening to Mr. Smith's half-truth of how he reprimanded me for wrongdoing, and I insulted him in his job and made jokes about his clothing in the class. I'd never have expected this from you. You seemed so respectful. I am, I protested. He started it. He... She cut me off. No, no, you will take responsibility for your actions, and you will not blame your teacher for your outburst. But he did do something. I tried again. She shook her head. You'll have three weeks of detention, four if you do not apologize. I believe that will give you enough time to ponder over what kind of character you want to portray to your elders. I nodded in defeat, but I remained stubborn. Fine, four weeks it is, I said, because I will not apologize when I have done nothing wrong. She shook her head again and started to write something down on a piece of paper. Five weeks, and I'll have to inform your parents about this new attitude. On our way back to class, Mr. Smith leaned over with his stinky breath all in my face and said, That will teach you to mess with my authority. Try tattling on me and no one will believe you, because I am the adult here, and when you come back unsuccessful, I'll make your life a living heck. I felt like he had a point there. No one was going to believe me. I was only a child. He had more of an impression and he'd been able to convince anyone much more than I could, so I decided to keep quiet. It wouldn't be worth it to try and try to explain to people and not be heard. I figured it would only make me more frustrated. So when my parents asked me what happened that evening, I merely told them that I didn't like Mr. Smith. He was a bully and I'd like to change my class. I didn't give them any further explanation. I left it like that. I guess they talked to the principal about my response because the next day, I was moved to a different class. But there was a bigger problem. Mr. Smith now had it out for me, and I had it out for him too. So if I said I couldn't concentrate in his classes before, now I was absent. I found it hard to understand anything he taught, and soon, I started to fail math. My A pluses turned to Bs, then to C minuses, then to Ds, and sometimes Es. I was doing poorly only in math. Every other subject would be an A or B, but there'd always be red ink beside my math grade. My parents were worried sick. 
No one could understand what was going on. It just didn't make any sense. The only people who could explain it to them were Mr. Smith or me. But none of us were going to do that. Maybe I should have, because eventually I had to sacrifice my hopes of getting a good junior SAT score for it. Anyway, they got me after school classes with Mr. Smith, which didn't help matters at all, and finally they hired a different person to tutor me at home. But it was too late. The junior SATs were way too close and I had too little knowledge in preparation for it. So I got a really sad score on my junior SATs. In my mother's words, I'd failed woefully. My mom and my dad were so upset because they'd had higher hopes for me. After countless deliberations and meetings with the principal, I changed schools. I was finally far, far away from Mr. Smith and all of his nastiness. I got a new math teacher and I still had sessions with my home tutor. Slowly but steadily, my math grades started to rise again. Soon I was at the top of my class and everyone was pleased with my tremendous improvement. I aced my actual SATs and IGCSE, and for fun, I took the ACTs and I aced that too. There was no problem with me after all, I just needed a completely different teacher. Due to my impressive grades, I was admitted into a highly prestigious university. And guess what I chose to study? Psychology. I specialized in children's psychology to learn to help kids who would possibly be going through what I had or even worse situations and wanted to be heard. Soon, I'd built a really big organization for myself that not only helped out with kids' psychological health, but also their academic and sports potentials, and I was proud of myself. All thanks to Mr. Smith, who turned out to be a really big motivation, and was thankfully just a distant memory, until he was not. My foundation was opening to hiring new staff with loads of experience and an appetite for improvement all the time. We wanted the best of the best for our kids, and we knew it wouldn't come cheap. I like to actively participate in that decision, even though I couldn't be there most of the time, since there would always be some other thing that needed my urgent attention. That Saturday was exactly like that. I wanted to stay in the meeting room and observe all the applicants during their interview, but there was a special difficult child who was having a meltdown in one of the rooms and no one had been able to calm her down, so I had to intervene. Just as I was leaving, I heard a very familiar squeaky voice stating that he'd had experience teaching at a lot of schools, and he mentioned my first high school. I was too distracted to focus and trace the voice back to an actual person in my memory. Before long, that thought was erased from my head, till I was going through the submitted resumes and portfolios that had been submitted, and I stumbled across a brown paper envelope with the name Mr. Jake Smith boldly written across it. Amused and a little bit irritated as memories came flooding back, I opened his envelope and started to analyze all the information he'd submitted. So he considered himself a lover of kids? What an absolutely tasteless joke. He wasn't worthy to be left in charge of any children. I flipped through his documents and did a little internet research. He'd put together a pretty impressive resume, if only he was a good person, but he wasn't so that was the end of that. I decided to email him though, not because I considered hiring him, I just decided even before I went through the file that he'd never set foot in one of my classrooms if I could help it. I just wanted to do something, that's the only way I could describe it, but I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do. I emailed him with my work email that clearly stated my name and role in my company. He immediately replied and asked if I'd ever attended my first high school. I responded that he didn't need to worry about that. He probably felt scared or guilty because he sent an almost 2,000 word mail saying that he'd wronged a girl with a similar name at my high school and he was sorry. He was a new person, blah blah blah. I didn't care much about his repertoire. I responded that I had no idea how that information would be useful to me. And then I invited him for another interview. His jaw practically dropped to the floor when he walked into the meeting room and saw me seated waiting for me. I held back my laughter, but it felt so pleasing to have authority over him. I asked him to take a seat and invited the rest of my employees who weren't occupied to attend the meeting. He knew something was up because he started to cower ever so slightly in fear. He looked older, more serious and maybe more mature. He was considerably young when he was my teacher. I started to wonder if he had changed since all these years, but I didn't let myself get carried away. I was glad he hadn't expected to see. Finally, 
My lack of social media presence had done something good for me. I cleared my throat and started, Mr. Smith, why do you think I should hire you? I, I have a lot to offer to the children in this institution and I cut him off. But you have a record of bullying kids, don't you? He looked away from me. Well, I, I kind of did engage, made jokes once in a while, but that was a really long time ago. So how do you plan to teach children about your hygiene? Because if I remember clearly, your foul breath kills any poor insect that goes too close to it. Mr. Smith looked taken aback. My employees started to murmur among themselves, and the bold ones even dared to bring out their phones to video the exchange. I would have warned them if it was any other time, but that day, it was welcome. My final question to you is, do you plan to wear those same brown trousers you used to wear every single day when you taught me? Or is this your new pair? He stood up with rage. This isn't fair, ma'am. I won't stay here and take this from you. I stood and faced him directly. Nothing isn't fair here. You have no right to take care of or instill any form of education in children. You are a mean, horrible person, and you can offer absolutely nothing to my organization. I take it you don't like how it feels to be treated the same way you treated us back then, don't you? Well, get used to it because you are scum, the lowest kind, and you deserve nothing good, and no reasonable company would hire someone like you. I faced the phone cameras pointing at me when I said the last part. Then I walked out of the room, leaving him looking broken and embarrassed. Right then, I felt on top of the world. I'm not saying that this revenge would make up for all of the experiences, the stress, the drama, and honestly the pain that you went through growing up, but it sure does help. That said, our next story is our revenge against the neighborhood tattletale. Millville is the town I grew up in. It's one of those types of towns that lay hidden somewhere in the suburban part of the state, and we were cool with that. If anything, it made us cherish our space more and fight out intruders. Even the empty houses were not given to outsiders. They had to have a close-knit relationship with someone already living within our community. In a way, it made us all feel like family. A family held by location rather than by blood or marriage. The town held a type of simplicity that was both refreshing and nostalgic. The air carried the gentle hum of lawnmowers, and the houses exuded a warm, lived-in charm. It was a place where neighbors knew one another by name, even to their middle names, where children's laughter rang through the streets, and where the sense of community flowed like a steady stream. But in this same town, we had Mrs. Edith Linkletter, and she was no ordinary neighbor. Her reputation transcended mundane interactions. Instead, she played the role of the neighborhood's vigilant guardian, an ever-watchful presence. Her finely tuned radar made her infamous for anything out of place, anything remotely resembling youthful mischief. Mrs. Linkletter had earned her title Meddler through her uncanny ability to detect the subtlest of missteps and promptly alert parents of the neighborhood's innocent explorers. With a penchant for being the bearer of news that ranged from a scraped knee on the pavement to an unsanctioned backyard campfire, Mrs. Linkletter's consistent vigilance had cast her as a central figure in the daily lives of Millville's residents. Her commitment to her role was unwavering, and she seemed almost magnetic in her attraction to anything that strayed even slightly from the ordinary. Yet, as much as Mrs. Linkletter's presence was an undeniable part of the neighborhood's fabric, it was also a source of mixed feelings. Her watchful eyes, while meant to ensure safety, sometimes felt like a stifling shroud over the carefree spirit of childhood. As the neighborhood children played tag, rode their bicycles, and embarked on imaginative quests, a glance from Mrs. Linkletter's window would elicit a peculiar blend of both discomfort and amusement. In her impeccable garden, trimmed hedges and meticulously arranged flowers were a testament to her precision-oriented nature. Or maybe it was just the evidence we needed that she had really huge problems with leaving things be, or at least leaving them to grow out even for a little bit. For the older generation in our neighborhood, she didn't do anything wrong. Not really. At least, not if you were cheating on your spouse or you had one slight bone of skeleton in your wardrobe exposed to her peering eyes. The resentment Mrs. Linkletter got was mostly from the younger generation, and the reason was simple. She was simply an overzealous detective 
always in pursuit of new mysteries to solve and youthful exploits to thwart instead of minding her gosh darn business. The problem was this, my friends and I formed a close-knit crew that was both clever and adventurous. I, Brandon, had a knack for devising schemes that combined wit and audacity. There was Sarah, with her vivid imagination and artistic flair. Jake, the tech genius who could build anything. Mia, the fearless explorer. And Alex, our charismatic talker. Together, we shared a vision of a neighborhood where freedom and laughter reigned. The streets of our town were ours before we had to share them with Mrs. Linkletter, but after she moved in, whenever we roamed the streets, it became increasingly clear that the shadow of Mrs. Edith Linkletter loomed over our every move. Her watchful eyes scrutinized our laughter, our conversations, even our simplest games. What should have been carefree days filled with impromptu games and laughter now felt stifled, as if our actions were trapped within the confines of her gaze. Millville's tranquil existence underwent a subtle shift when Mrs. Edith Linkletter arrived. Her entry into the neighborhood was marked by an air of anticipation. A new neighbor, a fresh dynamic. For some of the people in the town, they wanted to know who the sheriff's sister was. Others, like myself, just wanted to know what it feels like to have someone new in the neighborhood. As moving trucks lined the streets, curious faces peeked through curtains eager to catch a glimpse of the newcomer who was about to become a prominent figure in their lives. She was tall and impeccably dressed. That day, we saw Mrs. Linkletter exude an aura of sophistication that contrasted with the easygoing vibe of Millville. Her home, a pristine abode with manicured lawns and flower beds, stood as a beacon of order amidst the cozy chaos of the neighborhood. A brass nameplate adorned the front door. Edith Linkletter, it read. Mrs. Linkletter's nosy behavior was a gradual revelation that emerged in glimpses, a spider weaving a web of curiosity that entangled the unsuspecting. Her morning ritual, as consistent as clockwork, involved peering through her living room curtains, surveying the street like a vigilant sentinel. Conversations that flowed between neighbors were subtly monitored, bits and pieces of lives being collected with every exchanged word. No event, no matter how seemingly trivial, escaped Mrs. Linkletter's watchful eyes. Children's playdates, impromptu barbecues, and even simple walks to the mailbox were noted in the mental ledger she meticulously maintained. The children in the neighborhood quickly learned to modify their behavior when within her view, trading exuberant shouts for hushed tones and playful races for composed walks. It was pretty annoying that the innocent actions of kids became fodder for Mrs. Linkletter's information arsenal. A toppled bicycle was not just a minor accident, it was a potential danger that she felt compelled to report. Conversations carried in the wind were not mere chatter, they were clues to mysteries she must unravel. Her intentions, while rooted in concern, inadvertently stripped the neighborhood of its carefree spirit. Her reports, though well-intentioned, often led to exasperation. Parents who received her updates, ranging from scraped knees to imaginative tree-climbing expeditions, found themselves torn between gratitude for her vigilance and frustration over the infringement on their children's autonomy. What should have been minor escapades of youth were amplified into narratives of potential peril, thanks to the lens through which Mrs. Linkletter observed the world. But it was not even just the kids. Of course, we never really got the full gist of issues that happened in the older generation, but you could see that she had an impact there too. In the whole eight months since she arrived in the neighborhood, it was almost as if she was the civilian sheriff trying to find solutions and answers to questions that nobody asked her to. I overheard my mother and some of her friends one afternoon, when I got back from school, talking about how Mrs. Linkletter was the one who informed Donna that her fiancé had been fired from work. This would eventually lead to their separation, but exactly how Mrs. Linkletter found that out was unknown, and why she thought it was necessary to inform Donna baffled all logical reasoning. At neighborhood gatherings, Mrs. Linkletter was a fixture, not just in attendance, but also in the discussions that danced around the circle. Her anecdotes, offered with a hint of urgency and a sprinkle of drama, often focused on her observations. A jump from the swing set turned into a near catastrophe. A daring leap into a puddle transformed into a harrowing ordeal. The children, initially bemused, 
soon found themselves bewildered by the magnitude of their simple acts as described through her lens. As the months passed, her reports began to cast shadows over the once bright canvas of Millville. Laughter became stifled, spontaneity replaced by cautious glances towards her window. The neighborhood's children, once blissfully unaware of her watchful gaze, now navigated their world with a sense of restraint. I, like my friends, couldn't ignore the growing irritation that her constant meddling stirred within us. Our gatherings beneath the old oak tree, our haven of shattered dreams, echoed with hushed complaints about her interference. Each whisper felt like a reminder of how the freedom we once took for granted was slipping away. My role in our group's dynamics seemed to evolve from simply being the witty friend to becoming the strategist against Mrs. Linkletter's prying eyes. It was no longer just about outsmarting the school's toughest riddles. It was about reclaiming our right to be carefree children in our own neighborhood. I felt a responsibility to lead us back to those unburdened days. Stories from my friends painted a clear picture of how Mrs. Linkletter's meddling had woven its way into our lives. Innocent games of tag were transformed into covert operations, and water balloon fights turned into tactical maneuvers. Our once open conversations had become secretive whispers, as if we were sharing forbidden secrets. One day, when we were gathered beneath the oak tree, the frustration we were feeling and trying to suppress found its voice. Each of us recounted encounters with Mrs. Linkletter's all-seeing gaze, the irritation simmering beneath our words, and as I listened, an idea formed in my mind, a plan that would restore the balance between our desire for freedom and her insatiable urge to control. At least, that was what I thought, and my guys seemed to share the thought with me. With excitement, I shared my idea with the group, and their faces lit up with a mix of intrigue and anticipation. It was a scheme that would allow us to remind everyone in Millville, especially Mrs. Linkletter, that the spirit of youth could not be stifled. As we discussed the details, the knot of frustration within us seemed to loosen, replaced by a sense of purpose and unity. Maybe it was just sheer hope that tinged in our hearts, because we wanted the plan to make sense. We needed it to be. The days that followed were marked by a renewed sense of determination. Conversations shifted from dwelling on Mrs. Linkletter's interference to buzzing with excitement about our upcoming plan. With each passing day, we inched closer to the execution of our mission, a mission that would not only challenge her meddlesome ways, but also reignite the spark of freedom that had dimmed in our neighborhood. And as we huddled beneath our oak tree, plotting our playful rebellion, I knew that we were on the cusp of something that would forever change the way Millville saw us and the way we saw ourselves. So, the pranks began. The first prank was simple, innocuous really, but its impact was immediate and exhilarating. Disappearing newspapers became our opening act, a reminder that we could rewrite the script of our neighborhood. Under the cover of darkness, we stealthily relocated every newspaper from Link Letter's doorstep to a makeshift hideout we'd prepared days in advance. The next morning, the sight of Mrs. Linkletter's bewilderment as she scanned her barren porch was a source of hidden delight. Her confusion was our victory, a small rebellion against her intrusive reign. She was a creature of habit in that regard. We knew she would come out of her house a few minutes after 9 to pick up the daily paper delivery that should be close to her door or on the porch. It was easy to direct them to another place before she woke up in the morning, and this was exactly what we did. There was a schedule that first week for those who were to get her paper before she woke up throughout the first week. We knew we could not dare to exceed the week. After a week, she would lodge a formal complaint about the missing papers to the company. We couldn't let that happen. But just when she thought she had overcome whoever the paper thief was, she didn't understand that that was just the beginning of our mischief. She thought she knew how mischievous we could be. Turns out, she was just about to find out. The kind of town we were in was one where papers and milk come hand in hand. Every family, every house, had a delivery of dairy milk gracing their doorstep every day of the week that began with a T. Thursdays and Tuesdays. The good thing is that they were delivered at the same time as the paper. So we coordinated our efforts, swapping Mrs. Linkletter's regular milk delivery with a selection of chocolate and strawberry milk cartons. Well, empty cartons. The first morning after we had swapped them, her baffled expression as she peered into the milk crate was a masterpiece in itself, a testament to our audacity and her ever-increasing bewilderment. 
She lifted the basket where it was delivered, and instead of the usual heavy weight, she was met with a light feel. This was her first clue that something was wrong. We decided to stay hidden in the house adjacent to hers and see how she would react to the milk prank, and every second we spent hidden between the shrubs was worth it. Not even the increasing downpour could take the satisfaction from us. As the pranks continued, I found myself embracing my role as the mastermind, the orchestrator of our victories against the meddler. My mind became a wellspring of imaginative ideas that blurred the lines between reality and whimsy. The neighborhood began to whisper my name, anointing me as the ingenious puppeteer behind the pranks that challenged Mrs. Linkletter's vigilant watch. But this was my undoing because, as I should have known, we were kids, and kids sometimes succumb to higher authority. But the newfound respect that rippled through my friends was a reward I had not anticipated. Their admiration wasn't just for the pranks themselves, but for the audacity to reclaim our space, our laughter. Each disappearing newspaper, each mysteriously swapped milk carton, was a declaration of our refusal to be silenced. It was my wit that had sparked this rebellion, my creativity that had elevated us from mere victims to playful architects of chaos. Our pranks escalated, growing bolder with each passing day. And as I said, it was a good thing that she was a creature of habit. We could predict where she would be and when she would not be home. It made our work easier. Filled trash cans that seemed to multiply overnight, harmless graffiti that turned sidewalks into playgrounds. The neighborhood was our canvas, and our giggles became the symphony of our defiance. The streets that had once been stifled by Mrs. Linkletter's watchful eyes now echoed with the sound of our laughter, a cacophony of liberation. But as our pranks intensified, so did Mrs. Linkletter's suspicions. She became more suspicious of everything and everyone than she was before. She became a detective in her own neighborhood, piecing together fragments of our rebellion like a puzzle she was determined to solve. The neighbors, initially unaware of our campaign, soon found themselves under her scrutiny. Innocent glances were cast with uncertainty, and every unusual occurrence became a source of potential suspicion. Our group of friends was a tight-knit refuge, a proud team that reveled in each other's successes. My role as the brains behind our pranks had solidified my position among them. Sarah, with her artistic talents, painted our ideas into reality. Jake, the tech wizard, added his flair with contraptions that baffled and amazed. Mia, the daring explorer, brought a touch of adventure to our escapades. And Alex, the charming talker, helped smooth out any ruffled feathers. The neighborhood was our canvas, and with each prank, we painted it with a vivid reminder that our spirits could not be extinguished. Mrs. Linkletter's confusion only fueled our determination, her growing frustration feeding our resolve. Our pranks had transformed from simple acts of mischief into a declaration of our right to be carefree in our own community. The once muted streets were now alive with the rhythm of our rebellion. The pranks were no longer just about the disruption they caused, but about the laughter and unity they inspired. Our group had evolved from a cluster of friends into a tribe of liberators, rewriting the narrative of our neighborhood one prank at a time. Well, that was what we thought of ourselves. We didn't need anyone to prove what we were to us. We could make do by ourselves. But just when we thought we had finally gotten our peace from her, we slipped up. All it took was one weak link and our union was cracked. Amidst our triumphant escapades, a momentary lapse occurred within our circle. The unbreakable bond that held us together was frayed by an inadvertent slip of the tongue. One of us confided in someone outside our trusted group. And like a ripple in calm waters, the news spread beyond our control. The meddler, true to her name, was not one to let such an opportunity slip by. With newfound information in her grasp, she set out on a mission to unveil the faces behind the pranks that had disrupted her meticulously ordered world. Her inquiries led her through a web of whispers until the names of the culprits reached her ears, my name, and those of my friends. Inevitably, the meddler's determined march led her to my doorstep. As she knocked, her stern gaze bore through me, the weight of her suspicion palpable in the air. But fate, it seemed, was on my side that day. My parents, steadfast in their support, listened with polite concern but a resolute disbelief as she accused me of orchestrating the pranks. Their faces, composed yet unwavering, formed a united front against the meddler's accusations. 
While the meddler demanded accountability, my parents simply smiled and offered assurances of my innocence, at least to her face. Their unwavering confidence in my integrity sent a clear message. We would not be cowed by her assumptions or manipulated by her interference. When Mrs. Linkletter finally left our doorstep, the gravity of the situation settled in. I was grounded for a month as a consequence of my alleged involvement in the pranks, yet in an ironic twist, those four weeks of confinement became the most exhilarating days of my childhood. With each passing day, the atmosphere seemed to shift. Whispers carried the news that other parents had grown weary of Mrs. Linkletter's meddling, her constant intrusion into their children's lives. The parents, united by their frustration and emboldened by my parents' refusal to succumb to intimidation, began to question Mrs. Linkletter's authority. It was a whispered revolution that reached its climax one evening as the sunset bathed the neighborhood in warm hues. And just like that, the reign of the neighborhood police came to an end. No one wanted to know whatever story she had to say. Although I wasn't allowed outside for a month, those four weeks were the best of the times I was grounded as a child. Honestly, this whole story reads like a coming-of-age kids movie. I was getting visions of, like, an alternate reality Ed, Ed, and Eddie where, like, all the kids teamed up to try to go back against the evil, overbearing adult in the neighborhood. Sneaking around to the slightly private areas of their cul-de-sac or suburban neighborhood, riding these plans on their makeshift chalkboard thing. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.